On today's podcast, I'm going to be joined by Johnny from Stainless Diesel, and I wanted to chat with him about ways or things we can do to avoid a turbo failure, whether that's installation, maintenance, over-boosting it, throwing too much fuel at the turbo, or even just picking the right turbo for our application. So I'm definitely looking forward to chatting with him today. Before we get to it, I want to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors that help make the Diesel Podcast possible. First is Target Sports USA. If you're into other hobbies besides trucks, just like myself, it's always fun to head out to the range, go hunting, uh, do different competitions, things like that. Target Sports USA has a complete lineup of products and they have a really cool membership. It's $99 a year, and with that, you get free shipping, whether that's one box, 20 boxes, 50 boxes. You get that any any time of the year. Plus, there's an automatic 8% discount. And also, for hard-to-find calibers, different, thing like, different things like that, they also notify you first. So that's just a perk of being part of the membership. There's two giveaways that they do as well. One is an all-expense-paid hunting trip to Colorado, includes airfare, accommodations, licensing, and also complimentary meat processing and shipping back to you. So that's something that's really cool, once-in-a-lifetime trip. Plus, every year they give away an F-150, so it's a great way to, to score a, a new daily, um, be able to use it, you know, go back and forth to work, different things like that. So you're automatically entered into to win, potentially win one of those contests with just being a member. You go to targetsportsusa.com forward slash diesel PC and you'll have all the details right there. Also, Kershaw Knives, we appreciate them offering a discount code just for you guys. If you use code 2024diesel40 at kershaw.kaiusa.com, it's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear if you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site, something around the house. There's tons of choices for you there with different opening mechanisms, blade steel, blade shapes, different handle designs. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure head on over, use that discount code, and get 40% off MSRP. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Johnny from Stainless Diesel. Johnny, welcome back to Diesel Podcast. How you been? Doing good, buddy. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I got springtime, race season coming up, bunch of oh, cool, yeah. cool stuff, sure. truck upgrades, it's tax yep. refund time. Yep, <laughs> spring is sprung, that's for sure. <laughs> Before we get into like the, I just had this question, kind of, or this idea pop into my head the other day about having you talk with us about installing a turbo incorrectly and destroying it or picking the wrong turbo and oh, yeah. i think that'll answer a lot of questions that people ask yeah. Yeah. us i'm sure ask you a ton is how do i do it right but before we get to that i wanted to ask you about race season i know it's getting ready to kick off and you got a big race here in a couple of weeks oh yeah yeah coming up man so we're going to be down in uh orlando florida so first time the outlaw diesel super series has been down in orlando we've been to destin quite a few times florida there and uh, i'm excited to go so we the, the team's been uh, working hard all winter. Uh, got the motor freshened up from uh, Mr. Jeremy Wagler. Um, did a couple of upgrades to the car, so I think it's going to be uh, fruitful here. So best intentions to go fast. <laughs> it's all ready, to, all ready to go? Oh, yeah. Yep, pretty much ready to go. We were loading the trailer here uh, yesterday and today. Just kind of pre-prepping some things, uh, getting ready to go. So, yeah, next weekend. Um, not this weekend, but next weekend we'll be down at Orlando Speedway. So uh, Thursday testing, Friday, Saturday, it's uh, racing. So uh, that's blended in with, uh, I think it's Florida Florida Truck Fest, I guess. There's going to be some tug of truck stuff, show truck, show and shine stuff, uh, lots of drag racing. So it's going to be a great weekend for everybody. So good have, you, have you had time or, or enough time to be able to do like some testing there? In Indiana, or is it going to be kind of... Well, it's been a little chilly here. Uh, <laughs> we get teased a little bit. I think uh, yesterday it was like 68 degrees. Today it's back to about 48 degrees. So uh, it's been teasing us about the springtime. So no testing other than just, you know, firing it up, going through the gears, um, making sure there's no leaks, you know, doing some spool up tests, get some heat cycles on the motor, um, just some basics, nothing, nothing crazy we can catch up with you when you're there like do uh we did that episode in the pits that one time that was really cool yeah heck yeah maybe we can catch up as long as we got a good signal it's it'll be a good time so <laughs> i keep you in the loop one of the uh one of the questions we get all the time well there's a bunch of different ones but i thought <clears throat> having a conversation with you today would be really cool about how not to how to install a turbo correctly or how not to mess it up and oh, yeah I'm sure you've had calls from people who've gotten a turbo from you and they're like, hey, oh, yeah. it doesn't work. And you go through the thing and you're like, oh, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. What, yeah. where do we start? And I'll tell you what, you know, the basics, it's, I guess uh, there's so many different turbo platforms now that, that we play with. 
<clears throat> and if you go back to like our basic bread and butter, um, <clears throat> like the S S four hundred, for instance, it's got V band clamps that kind of hold the exhaust housing to the bearing housing, the compressor cover to the center section, you know, bearing housing as well. Um, probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people make um, with that is the V band clamp from the exhaust housing to the the center section. Um, can be put in a bind, essentially. So if you turn that clamp to where it's not freely um, not rubbing on the exhaust housing uh, in a bind, because you can put it on wrong pretty easy. Um, we try to send them, basically, we send them out in the orientation we'd like to keep them in. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, they take exhaust housings off the turbo, bolt it on the manifold, and kind of slip the cartridge in, which is really common. Um, but in doing so, when you put the clamp on wrong, it binds against the exhaust housing if you put it together wrong. So that what that can do is it can cause the turbo to not sit flush in the exhaust housing. So when you run it, uh, sometimes the turbine wheel will immediately kind of start rubbing the exhaust housing. Um, sometimes it lightly touches the exhaust housing until you get some boost on it. And then um, the clamp doesn't fully uh, engage uh, because it's in a bind. So the exhaust pressure can actually cause the turbo to go off axis or go sideways a little bit, kind of gap out to one side. And you'll see it with the uh, exhaust soot tracking out between the housings. And it gets kind of interesting sometimes, but that's probably one of the most common mistakes for that S400 platform that we see. What is the best way to avoid that bind on the clamp if during install you have to move it or change it from the way you guys set it? So there's uh we've done some uh, YouTube shorts, uh, stainless diesel YouTube, and we've done some TikTok kind of like how to destroy your turbo in five five seconds or five minutes, something like that. And it essentially just kind of walks through the orientation of the clamp with a little more detail. So if you guys ever have a question, man, check that out. Um, but it, essentially the biggest way to do it, um, the turbo foot, see if it's a T6 foot or a T4 foot, you'd want the uh, threaded portion of the clamp to be really close to the foot orientated that way. And that's the best way that I could explain it um, without having pictures and pointing at things. Yeah, if somebody does put the cartridge on first and then they're putting on the exhaust housing, if it, that exhaust housing, when you're putting it on, if it happens to touch the, the turbine wheel or <clears throat> maybe a little bit of force, like, does that mean that that wheel's damaged, it's done, it's not going to perform. Or I'm just thinking about somebody yeah. doing it in their garage yeah, and they yeah. barely do it, they, ba they barely touch yep. it. So, and it's one of those things where those those ink and L turbine wheels are really, really hard. You know, you're talking about some material that's well over 55% nickel. It's a really, really strong material to take the heat and, and the abuse, you know, uh, that we ask these things to go through. Um, so if it does touch down, uh, typically on an off-axis piece or like, one little bitty grain of sand between the surfaces, it's, it's almost enough to to really throw off the clearance enough to almost make that exhaust uh, housing bore touch the turbine wheel. Um, when it does touch down, um, if and when, yeah, almost when it's off axis like that, it almost wears it concentrically. So you'd be surprised what we've seen back in the shop, uh, at least from the drag racer side with nitrous use you know melting paddles off and they've ran it that way and it's been slow to spool for a couple <laughs> races and and uh check it out johnny and then by the time we get it you know it's missing inducer paddle wheel chunks in it and it didn't really destroy the bearings so uh interesting how we see things come back it's been you know pushed to the far limits for sure um when we get into i think of the mounting part is there are there any common issues you see when people are mounting the turbo to the manifold, whether it's with the studs, over torquing it, yep, anything like that? Well, I mean, like, in, for the most part, I think, like, say that a guy, you know, say, for instance, you had the cylinder head off to put a head gasket on or, you know, service and things. You take things apart and back together. Um, what we see is guys are saying, you know, can, you, can I reuse my gasket? And in a pinch, I guess you can, and we've done it at, at the race, you know, so you had to pull something apart and get after it and you didn't have a spare gasket. Um, we've seen guys use some RTV, but obviously, you know, a new gasket's the best way to go. In a pinch, you can put the old gasket back on, but I really get a question about the gaskets. There's some, there's some 
stamped raised uh, ridges in the gaskets. And uh, I get a question once in a while that says, hey, you know, which way, which way do those ribs go? Towards, towards the manifold or uh, towards the turbo? And uh, it's kind of interesting. It's like it, it seals both ways. But the biggest thing is, is with heat over time, uh, it can it can make that surface not as flat as it should be. Um, so I tell guys in shops, especially if it's been on for a while and you pull it apart, um, take that exhaust housing inlet flange, you know, T4, T6, you know, T3. And if you have a belt sander at the shop, or a lot of guys have those, um, you can you can set that exhaust housing flange on a belt sander and you'll see the low spots real quick just to see if it's not flat. And being cast iron, you know, you, you can sand it a little bit on a flat flat surface plate uh, to get that gas gasket back flat surface to seal the gasket better that way. So as they get older and uh, a lot of heat cycles go through there, that's a good trick to, to make it work better. Are there ever any issues that you've seen with the oil feed line, drain tube, the oil supply on, oh, yeah. a, on, a, on a turbo? I mean, it's, yeah, it's in pretty much any turbo platform. It's like thinking about essentially what's going on there. It's, it's pressure fed and gravity drain. And we see, um, essentially you can take a turbo, I can take a turbo and take the oil seals completely out of it. When you have an adequate drain, I can pump oil through it at, you know, whatever oil pressure, you know, it's factory, you know, 60 pounds, 70 pounds of, of peak oil pressure on a lot of the, you know, the newer diesels. Um, and, uh, the race diesels, you know, over a hundred, 120 PSI of oil pressure. Um, but, uh, if your drain is adequate, you could, I could pretty much pump oil through it and not have oil leak out the front and rear of the turbo with no oil seals in it. Um, and it's just because the drain's adequate. So you, when you put seals in it, um, you know, obviously it's supposed to have seals and we build them that way. But when you do the drain too small for the oil volume that's coming in the turbo, um, it just uh, it doesn't have time to drain. So it, it fills up the little cavity, bearing cavity, and it starts putting pressure on the seals. And uh, it's it's typically you're, you're going to see it come out both ends of the turbo if the drain's really uh, too small, but sometimes it'll just seep out a little bit too. So um, the factory, I guess, fun fact here, the factory HX35 on a, on a 12 valve Cummins, it's it's a seven eighths inch drain hose. Um, it, it, the fact the inside diameter of that's three quarters of an inch. So if you had like micrometers or or a big drill bit, you know, you can kind of a three quarters of an inch drill bit hole size. So we see some of these aftermarket um, fancy billet drains come in here and they'll have a hole that's under a half inch, like maybe 430 thousandths, you know, 470 thousandths. That is too small for like a dash six oil feed line on an S400, like performance, good, you know, something that's going to make some, some boost. Um, and I like dash six on an S400. Just if you're going to run it on high shaft speed as a single um, compounds, you can get away with two dash fours um, in a compound system. You know, the shaft speeds are about you know 20, 30 percent slower than they would be, you know, as a single. Um, you can get away with a little bit different uh, oil flow rates. So in our testing, um, anything over 120,000 ish, 115,000 on an S400, we want dash six oil feed line on it for sure. And uh, max speeds in that 135, 136,000 on a S400 base, um, just to keep the bearings happy. So yeah, you can get into trouble with the drain size being too small. And we so see that quite a bit. In general, would you say it's best if you're replacing the drain tube to just go with a stock one, or stock so, size one? We, well, I mean, the stock ones are pretty good. Uh, there's probably some of the best ones I've seen out there have a. Uh, um, give a shout out to the fleece boys and they make a hell of a drain for a turbo um, beautiful piece billet pieces and they are adequate on the inside diameter so that's the key um, but uh, basically that uh, I think there's a uh, 630 thousandths is about the smallest we want to see on a drain fitting at the turbo so when people are talking in terms of you know I got a dash 8 line or a dash 10 line or a dash 12 line um they'll look up the specs online and it'll give it the given diameter, you know, like, uh, you know, dash eight would be a half inch inside. It's definitely too small. Uh, dash 10 is close to five eighths. Um, dash 12, you're talking, now you're talking, you know, three quarters of an inch or a little bigger, depending on whose line specs you look at online. 
but the fittings tend to be a bit smaller than the line. So when you're looking at adequate line size, dash 10 is a really common one people use. Um, so the line's typically adequate, but it's the fitting at the block or the fitting at the turbo uh, that we see come in that's restrictive on the size. Um, so that you want to be careful there. What are some other maybe failure points during the install or things people didn't know during the install that they should have done that could kind of sneak up and... Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. You know, damage the turbo. So, and then like, you know, I guess some of the, just seen a video the other day, it's kind of neat. Maybe I can send it to you uh, to check out sometime. Um, but when you, when you, when you first start a truck, especially like a Duramax, because it gets um, basically the oil pump, it, it pumps all through the engine. And then typically when you see where the oil feed is, it, it's already through the mains, it's already through the cam bearings, and then it gets to the turbo last. Um, so when you fire up a, a Duramax, I bet you're going to, and you see you took the oil line and shoved it in a bucket, you might get like five seconds, maybe six seconds of no oil flow before it hits the turbo, especially if it's been sitting for you know a week or a uh, truck sitting over the weekend, you go to fire it up, you know, it's just a drain back. It drains back oil. Um, it's interesting to watch anyway. Um, some of the common stuff is not as bad because the oil pumps right in the front the, and it's the oil pump hits that oil filter head pretty quick. Um, so they're not quite as bad on delay on startup. Um, oil quality is huge. Like we've been, we recommend, you know, EFR, uh, from hotshot secret and some of the best oil you can get. Um, filtration is huge. Uh, keeping a turbo alive, you know, as far as that goes, um, we see, uh, basically some some issues with uh if people put a turbo on like we will pre-lube all of our turbos with um it's either going to be you know 30 weight uh or or some you know even 20 50 weight depending on what the guys are using at the application but we've also put some assembly lube in there a lot of times we're, we're doing hot shot secret assembly lube on a lot of that stuff um so it's pre-lubed but you'll also read uh a lot of people want you to squirt some fresh oil in, into the inlet of the turbo and spin the wheel a little bit. That's pretty common practice um, for a lot of guys, but we'll, we always pre-build everything and lube everything up before it goes. So we're, we're not too worried about dry starts, but you'd be surprised at the delay and time it takes uh, for the turbo to be uh, pumped up. Uh, I've seen some really interesting stuff on uh, on a six O's as far as time base for it, oil to come up, oil pressure to come up at the turbo. So it's interesting. Uh, different applications. I could definitely see where filtration, oil quality, all those things are are going to play a huge part because oh, yeah. that turbo is dependent on that oil for its balancing and how it's operating. And so yep. if you've got some contamination in there, I'm sure it can wreak havoc on a turbo. Yep. So we like the turbo always, always will tell you a story. We get it apart and uh, on the bench, you know, if we got something coming in for a rebuild, you know, might have been out there for a while, might have been out there for a week, might have been out there for two years coming in to get looked at, you know. Um, we'll see if you have liquid sandpaper running through your engine. The 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 first place it's gonna show up is in the turbo. The the tightest the tightest bearing clearance in the whole entire engine is the turbo to shaft and from the bearing uh to the journal that it's in inside the bearing housing. So like four Warner stuff, for instance, you know, like the, the S four hundred base stuff, you know. Uh, the inside diameter clearance between the bearing and the shaft is around uh, nine ten thousandths, just a little bit under a thou. And on the outside of that bearing to the bore, you're you're one point two to one point three thou ish uh, on the outside diameter. So that clearance is super tight. So when you when you look at your rod bearings, for instance, in a Cummins, uh, three and a half thou, you know, so so way less than half, maybe a third of the oil clearance on the, on the turbo than what you're going to see between a rod bearing and a, and a more main bearing in, in the engine. So the first place uh, trash in the bearings are going to show up and, and uh, you're going to, we're going to see it. We call it record player. Basically you get some little grooves that look like record uh, record player kind of tracks on a record um, right exactly where the bearings are and on the bearings and on the shaft. So every turbo tells us the story. That's for sure. When we get it apart. On the compressor side, do you guys notice anything like I'm thinking maybe a boot or, or something like that is maybe worn, has been on the truck a while and you're able to get dirt and debris in and then it's just getting sucked right into the intake. Is that something that you've maybe seen some issues with over the years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can tell like uh, 
when the turbo wheel gets a little sandblasted. You know, we've had some guys um, uh, over time, you know, especially the tow haul guys, man. These guys, they drive they drive for days and days on end, you know, and, and uh, some of them are in the, you know, out west in Arizona. A lot of the guys out there like the dry air filters instead of like an oiled one, you know, like the S&B filters or, you know, a good oiled filter. They like the dry filters out west. But, um, man, the pre-filters really do help kind of keep that stuff alive too. Um, a little bit longer between service and your your air filter but boy you'll see the compressor compressor wheels get sandblasted it's kind of amazing to see uh the extent at which they get sandblasted and what's really funny is um when you're looking at the face of the turbo you'll see a little bit of erosion or something on the leading edge of the blade but it's really more prevalent or, or more wear in the map groove area so where the map groove intersects with the main blade um you know, just back behind the leading edge of the of the wheel, uh, that's where you see a lot of the erosion happen. Believe it or not, I think that's where just good truck maintenance, you know, can yep. go a long way with the filter cleaning it, replacing it. Oh heck yeah, heck yeah, yeah things yeah. like that. We've so we've seen oils. Um, like you'll you'll notice like when that filter gets kind of plugged, um, it actually pulls a really weird negative pressure on the oil seal in the front, and it can actually pull oil out of the of the turbo to some extent it'll pull it'll suck oil past the seal it seems like it's uh like just just dirty air filters can cause that so it's kind of interesting common question we get from you guys a lot is hey i need a diesel engine i either you know i can't wait this long to get one or normal place i get stuff from it it, it just takes too long or i don't they don't have the parts in it that i need maybe my truck's not stock or i tow heavy with it i don't want to go back with just a stock engine DFC Diesel is uh, a sponsor of the podcast. We worked with them, you know, hand in hand on doing episodes, answering technical questions. They have a complete lineup of Cummins, Duramax, and Power Stroke remanufactured engines that are set to a standard of ISO 9001 2015 standards, which is a huge deal in the aftermarket. And there's certain levels of quality testing, validation that are required for that. So you know when you get one of those engines, the type of quality that's built behind it with an industry leading warranty that's really comprehensive. And, you know, the other thing with that is, you know, sometimes the options that are out there, it's just, it's a basic OEM engine. You want a little bit more. You don't want to have the same failure again. So there's a bunch of different series of engines that they have um, from core um, street tow haul and also the speed of air series, which we've covered on the podcast before. There's a lot of really cool benefits to it. And if you have questions about that, reach out to them. If you don't know the type of engine that you're looking for, if you go to dfcdiesel.com, there's a ton of info there. You can send an email or you can reach out to them. Also, they're working with speed of air pistons, which it's the only piston that pays for itself. And there's a lot of really cool technology behind it. So you can add that into your build and be able to get better fuel economy. Um, you know, increased power, increased torque, and, and better engine life out of it. Um, you know, some of the most common engine applications or, or, or series of engines that they have with that lead time, a lot of them are in stock or they have really short lead times. So you can check your favorite retailer or, or go to dfcdiesel.com, uh, check them out, see what's in stock, see what you can get. If you have questions, maybe you want to do, you know, something that's outside of the, the normal series of engines, they have tons of choices for rods, cranks, pistons, valve train upgrades, tons of different things. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure and head on over and check them out. What's what's maybe the craziest or wildest kind of failure? Like I think of somebody who's working on something on the weekend, they call you Monday and they're like, this turbo doesn't work. It, you yeah. know, I had an issue with it. And then you get it back and you're like, what happened to this thing? Yeah, like, what happened to this thing? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I had, uh, not too long ago, um, uh, we're, we're close to, uh, like the 8090 toll road is kind of a big, big, you know, main, main thoroughway, thoroughway, uh, highway here, toll road from Chicago. And it goes straight over towards, you know, uh, like Maumee, Ohio and, you know, Pennsylvania, New York. So it's a big, big hot dog street uh, road here. But, uh, the semi guys, and once in a while, they'll call us out of the blue and say, Hey, uh, um, my turbos tore up and, uh, seen, found you on the interwebs and, uh, you got one of these part number turbos. I'm like, sure do. So they'll come and you know, get one from the guys here. And, uh, I, I always tell them, like, if you, if you have a failure, pull your air filter apart in the semi trucks, you know, the class eight stuff, pull the air piping apart, pull everything apart, uh, especially if it spit the wheel out into the, into the intake. And I, the, the guys like, oh yeah, I cleaned her all out. I cleaned her good. 
you know, and uh, so he jumps, gets the turbo, puts it on. He's, he gets to Chicago. I guess he was on his way to Chicago. So he calls me, he gets over there and said, said Johnny, I uh, pulled the air pipe off of it just to look at the old turbo. And uh, it looks like it's been chewing on something. I'm like, I said, did you, did you take the air filter out? Like I told you and put a new one in. Well, no, I just cleaned the pipes out. So essentially it ate the rest of the turbo by the time he got to Chicago, what well, remainder of the old blades, you know, and uh, he had to come back. So we doctored him back up. It didn't destroy everything, but um, put a new compressor in, check balance, uh, kind of beats the parts up pretty bad. So that's, that's probably most of the weird ones that we see uh, here lately. Um, I did see, uh, well, the VGTs are interesting too. Uh, did, you know, you know, going from S400 stuff and semi trucks and you know, back into the VGT stuff. Um, I seen a guy, there was a guy that was calibrating his own truck, essentially playing around a little bit with some HP tuner, I think. Um, and uh, he was playing with the spool up, I guess, a little bit on the vein calibration. And uh, I do know if you, uh, if you keep the veins closed too long or too much on a Duramax, EGTs can get relatively hot. And uh, it's interesting to me um, how many people don't have, say, an EGT gauge or even a, a, an adequate boost gauge. You know, I've got some guys that got the, the edge CTS monitors and, oh, it's reading 36 pounds of boost, but I've got, you know, X amount of fuel and more than likely it's making 50 or 45, you know. Um, and then uh, it's one of those things where the turbo tells us a story and some of the factory um, map, you know, map sensors uh, don't read over, you know, that low mid 30 pounds of boost or 35, 37 pounds. And then they think it's reading accurate, but it, you're pretty much out of boost reference uh, with the factory sensor. So aftermarket uh, add-ons for the CTS, I think they do a hundred pound add-on. You can read up to a hundred pounds on some of those or, uh, you know, just, just a good boost gauge is very well warranted when you guys, guys are out there playing a little bit just to kind of have accurate data. And EGTs are huge, uh, especially on, you know, like the Duramax stuff and v anything with the VGT, um, playing around with some of that. So uh, you can melt the veins and melt the turbine wheel. And you can do stuff in short order uh, pretty quick, not knowing how hot you're running down the road. So I've been hearing from a lot of companies on the podcast about the need for gauges and uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> whether they're mechanical or electronic. Yep. Just just monitoring that stuff. I'm kind of, I think I'm a little bit old school. I kind of like the mechanical gauges a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I do too. They're not as handy. Like, it is cool yep. on an electronic one. You don't have to look at it. You just, you know, reference the highs and lows. But yeah. I just yeah. I just love being able to look over, see the gauges. Oh, heck, and... yeah. Heck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, like, and I still tell this guy, you know, because uh, we play we play in all the levels around here. We got some really uh, budget-minded stuff, you know, and then we have some, some really high-end crazy stuff, too, you know, for the racing guy stuff. But... I mean, back in the day, we used to go to we used to go to our local auto parts store and go buy a little. I think the, I forget the name of it, but it was like a nineteen or back then nineteen dollars, or I think they're twenty nine or thirty bucks, five bucks now. A hundred pound oil pressure gauge, just a cheap oil pressure gauge kit, and you can take that and hook it up as a boost gauge real quick. So it's it doesn't even have to be fancy. So, <laughs> you know, and then uh, we used to uh, I don't know uh, some of my sled pole tractor buddies, you know. Um, they wouldn't have uh, an air, they can't look at the gauge going down the track or, you know, same thing. Uh, I don't know how much boost it's making, Johnny. And uh, I'd go get a tire gauge from the gas station, just something that goes to 120 pounds, cut the tip off that you would put on, a, it's the old stick out kind, it kind of looks like an ink pen, and it pu pushes out when you put it on a tire, how far it pushes out is the boost, or is how we look at it for boost instead of just tire pressure. We cut the top off and then three eighths uh, piece of hose and shove it down there with a bunch of clamps. And at the end of the pull, they get out and pop their little side cover on the tractor, and you'd <laughs> see how far it was sticking out. So that was about a ten or fifteen dollar quickie fix tattletale way to do it, you know. So there's some smart ways to do it. Uh, obviously, you know we we love the the stuff we get from SNS with the Motec stuff, but that's on a that's on a whole other crazy level. But um, there's always uh, a few different ways to skin a cat. That's for sure. And what about when we get into buying a turbo and yeah. making a mistake? And I, I just think of, you know, turbos, you know, what they cost, the performance, or the, even the reason you need it. It okay, might not yeah. be racing. It might just be to get your truck running. 
Oh, yeah. Where do you find yeah. that a lot of customers can make a mistake? So I think it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of good information on the internet. Um, and there's a lot of bad information on the internet when it comes to like what application might be best for, for like a gentleman, um, had a guy, uh, he bought a turbo, um, uh, not too long ago, just basically bought a turbo. Now oh, my buddy's got one of these and I put it on and it did real good. And then, and then it, uh, then it knocked the bearings out. I'm like, okay. I said, well, let's kind of look at it and let's go over your setup. Um, so essentially he had a, had a turbo, uh, set up for around, you know, 750, 800 horsepower on a, on a five, nine, but come to find out he's got a six, seven and he's got about 1100 horsepower worth of fuel, um, and some unknown <laughs> boost gauges and no, you know, the, the, the CTS monitor kind of scenario. I don't know. I don't know what kind of <laughs> boost it was making and that, that kind of thing, you know, so we try to do the our due diligence on uh, online, you know, we've got a lot of stuff that we recommend certain ranges of turbos for certain power levels and certain uh, drive abilities and that kind of thing. But um, when in doubt, always, you know, shoot us an email, give us a call, um, do a little more research, just like there's so many nuances with trucks, you know, like even gear ratio and tire size comes into play. Um, torque converter stall speeds are huge for drivability um, on single turbos and, and different things like that. So I see the probably one of the biggest mistakes is is we hear in the shop is hey my buddy's got one of these and I want one and it's and it's good uh to, to have a reference point on to, to look at something that you want to do but um maybe go into it take that extra step and just just look at it a little further and see how much different your setup might be than the next guy uh that you seen talking about something on the internet. So um just to make sure you have a successful outcome and have a lot of fun instead of you know, run into the, uh, run into some pro tr trouble, you know, problems on a different setup. So that's where I think, that's where I think you can definitely get lost because there's, there are good recipes or ranges or things, information you can find out there. Oh yeah. But, but to me, turbos are so complex because there's so many different variables in it. The fueling, oh, yeah. the tuning, what elevation are you at? Yep. <clears throat> what size oh, yeah. exhaust housing am I going to run? What size turbine will? What size compressor will? Where is oh, most of yeah. my RPM done? What kind of tires? What? Yep. And so it, yep. it's so hard to say you need exactly this because this guy in Florida ran it and I'm in Montana. Right, right. right. Is, is it still going to run the same? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you get into elevation, it just you just be surprised at how much different um, things are at 5,000 feet versus, you know, 800 feet or sea level, you know. And the way things act and EGTs are different and drivability is much different. So um, it's interesting for sure when it comes to that. Uh, and it's it, it, on the, on the BGT stuff, you know, like the Duramax stuff or even the, you know, the 6.0 stuff, anything with the variable veins, they work awesome uh, at elevation as long as you size things correctly. Um, we've been, been looking at some different things here oh, recommendations we've got some really detailed recommendations online is under those turbochargers specifically about kind of what we would recommend um in different applications so you know, feel free to jump online and read and a lot of people don't read they just i want that and i'm checking out because my buddy's got it which is great but go that extra step and read a little bit more info into it and make sure your setup's uh, going to work with that um, <laughs> I just thought of another question. I probably should have asked it earlier, but I think it might bridge the gap between the two a little bit. And that's with turbo surge. Yep. So I, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure it wreaks havoc on the bearings and everything in the turbo. But oh, yeah. if I'm, if I'm buying one and I get it installed and say, I follow all, all your recommendations, install goes smooth and I'm just cruising or lightly getting into the throttle and yep. I start to get turbo surge because I definitely wanted this one size because my buddy had it and he made yep. you know yep. the power. Oh yeah. What, oh, yeah. How does turbo surge factor into damaging the turbo if it's already on or sure. thinking about which one you're going to buy? Well, and then and basically for those that might not know, turbo surge is essentially you know the, think about this: the engine's an air pump, and the turbo is an air pump. So when the turbo surges, essentially the turbo is making more airflow than the engine can can ingest at that RPM or at that that load. And it could be low to part throttle. It could be really wide open throttle at the high end too. We've seen surge both ways depending on the application. Um, but uh, essentially make the turbos a little more efficient at that low load and low RPM than what the engine can uh, eat. Essentially it can't eat that much air. So it starts backing up to the turbo 
and that's that salt shaker kind of maraca sound you'll hear. And on the logger or on your, your boost gauge, it goes to 40 pounds and 20 pounds and 30 pounds and back to 10. And it's back and forth, like just the gauge is going crazy. And you hear this crazy, uh, you know, I could call it salt shaker sound, you know, maraca sound shaking back and forth. So I've heard it before. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you know where I'm getting at. So essentially the a way to get a turbo out of surge. Um, we've seen guys go from, say, a stock engine. So it's a volumetric efficiency of a stock engine, say, not ported cylinder head, and say, a stock camshaft. I've seen a 12-valve get out of surge just by changing a camshaft, essentially made the motor move more air uh, sooner in the curve just by having a better camshaft. Um, and then we can do things like like our larger AR, what, what, what the industry, I guess, calls a race cover. Um, it moves more air across the whole entire curve, of boost curve, but we can change the compressor cover and take surge away by slowing down the amount of air that it's producing at a given, you know, shaft speed or a given point uh, in its life um, as far as like drivability on a certain motor combo. Um, exhaust housing, you can go up a size, basically slow down the turbo a little bit so it's not pushing as much air at that low of RPM and that'll help get you out of surge. Um, in certain applications we do machine the exhaust turbine wheel, essentially, we'll do a flow clip on it. So it takes a little bit of efficiency off the bottom end um, to get it away from surge, but it also gains some efficiency at the top end of higher boost ratio because it's lowering drive pressure a certain percentage. So we do some little stuff uh, behind the scenes that you might not be aware of, but just for the application because we know what works for that combo. There's, I think this year, of any recent year I could think about is one where I'm really excited because I've been hearing or talking with companies in other parts of the aftermarket that are either they're to market with emissions on products or they're really close. And I mean, tuning yeah. injectors, lots of other things that I think we necessarily haven't seen in a long time with the newer but, trucks. Yeah. Oh yeah. When you look at the VGTs and, and the product line that you have, it seems like the power levels are going to be jumping here pretty soon. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. there's, you know, emissions compliant yep. fuel injection pumps, all these things. So I see power 600, maybe a little bit over. Sure. Does Heck a yeah. VGT give you more freedom because you have that electronic control to maybe go a little bit bigger, be able to flow that air on the top end to accommodate some of these products that are coming out and some of the power levels that people want? Or, or what's your opinion on the, the VGT side of things as we see the average power number jumping up because of these new products? Yep. I think the, I mean, technology has been amazing the last, just, just even two to three years, just crazy how much faster uh, things are changing in the turbo world and how much more efficient you can make something it in the same similar size turbo that you would maybe make 20, 30% less power, just, you know, five to eight years ago. And now we can make quite a bit more power. And um, in the VGTs, I mean, again, you know, with the, the technology being there for drivability and, um, you know, keeping EGTs under control, even though the turbo rotor group is lighter or, or larger, rather, it's also lighter in our case where we do our nine blade uh, turbine wheels, which sound really interesting and aggressive on jet engine sounds, along with our five blade compressor wheel. But um, that technology has moved so fast just the last last few years. It's crazy. Um, we've got some some interesting stuff coming out for the Dodge stuff. Uh, we've got quite a bit of sizes available for the Dodge stuff. Um, and uh, we basically just passed 49 state legal uh, testing with our with our fifth gen turbos. Um, we're moving forward to finish that out to get the the 50 state legal testing that's a process uh, currently. So uh, you know, as far as emissions compliant stuff, we've, we've got a whole line of stuff coming very soon. Everything's in testing now. Uh, we, everything's working out on all the platforms. So, but the the Dodge stuff just passed, and then we moving forward with. Uh, Duramax and the Ford stuff as well. That's really cool. That's that's something that's so needed. I mean, to to sell a product and to get it out there, and then to have that that data behind it. Oh, yeah. So when somebody calls, you can confidently sell it, then confidently install it, yep. and you know, be able to be able to get it out there. Which 
I know added delay, and for the longest time, I'd get listeners saying, well, on my 5.9, I had products within six months, and I've had my 6.7 for three yep. or four years, and I'm still waiting for sure. stuff, but it's so exciting Thank now you. because they're all starting to come up. Yep, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a process uh, to go through to do that, and then uh, we're, we're happy to do it and push and learn and make things better for the future, you know, for sure. With um, some of the other products you guys are working on, or maybe some of the new things that maybe you can't talk about yet, but things that we should be looking looking out for, Both. whether it's with Power Stroke, Duramax, mm -hmm. Cummins. Heck yeah, yep. So we've got uh, we're working on a, I guess a bigger unit for the Duramax stuff, and it's coming coming down the road here. It's, it's, a, it's a I guess we want to maybe call it something in the stage three R range, um, where the it's going to be relatively uh, a neat piece. Um, you know, a thousand horsepower capable kind of scenario for VGT, um, factory bolt on, you know, it's probably going to be more for these, uh, sled pull guys, drag race guys that want to be stock appearing, uh, something in that range. So we're working on that, uh, 72 and a half millimeter turbine, I believe on that one. And we do have a nine blade version for that and, uh, 68, uh, compressor wheel on that one. So it's going to be pretty neat, uh, big platform, um, in the Dodge stuff, we've had out, uh, I guess we call it our Gen 2, kind of turbo uh, before the Cummins VGT platform. So as everybody knows, about our, our basic tow boss is a 6060 size, and we have a boss unit, which is a 6367. We've had out uh, for a long time, but just uh, as the first of the year, we kind of added some, some new flavors out there. Um, I've got a, a bigger exhaust wheel. So we've been limited for years and years on a 67 millimeter turbine wheel uh, for the, the Cummins VGT platform. So we've got some trick vein cage and uh, exhaust housings uh, that are pretty much proprietary to, to our setup. Um, and it's a different bearing housing uh, to allow the larger vein cage. Um, don't want to go into too many technical details, but essentially that allows for a larger turbine wheel. So 71 millimeter, 72-ish range turbine, exhaust turbine. Um, and then we've got a 65 compressor and a 68 compressor on that turbine wheel uh, available. Um, and then we also took that same uh, thing and kind of expanded on our 63 to have a 64 millimeter turbine wheel too. So five part numbers now, uh, kind of like the Duramax is where we've got a wide range of sizes. Now we have that available for uh, the Cummins platform. And... Um, when we designed the vein cage, uh, I'm not sure you've probably, you've probably heard some of the Duramax stuff with the nine blade turbine and how aggressive it sounds yeah. <laughs> uh, on some of the video. And that's, that's a nine blade with a, without getting too crazy, it's, it's the way that uh, the, the resonance frequency sounds out of the exhaust in relationship to the, to the vein cage and the turbine wheel design. And that's kind of that, it puts the, the audible tone in kind of the human's ears range of hearing. So it's kind of like tuning a guitar string to some extent. So it just changes the tone when you change components. Um, and uh, on the Cummins, we've experimented with the new vein cage and it's, we've got some videos floating around out there. Um, we've only got a handful of uh, beta testing going on right now, uh, I think for the last couple of months. But um, that's going to be like an event or Gen 2 size, which would be like that 63, 64, 65, uh, and the 68, the bigger sizes like that uh, with the new vein cage. But uh, it's got a crazy – have you ever heard of Cummins VGT sound like a 6.0 or yeah. a new Duramax? Yeah. We we have that now. <laughs> so that that's happening. So um, – and it's just one of those things where uh, it, it, some people want an aggressive exhaust note and some don't, so we build them multiple different ways. So we've got options. That's really cool. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. Duramax buddies back in the day or the six liter guys I'd know. And I'm like, man, I want my truck to sound like that. Or, yep. you know, it's just, there's something yeah. about turbo and sound. Oh, yeah. It's it's yep. just, you yep. want it. You want to hear it. Yeah, for, for years, you just couldn't make a Cummins VGT sound like, you know, a 6.0. Or you couldn't make it sound like the new Duramax stuff that we're doing. Um, and uh, now you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you guys, it's you guys, here. You guys have definitely been busy yeah. since the last time we chatted. Oh yeah, working on a bunch of neat stuff. So, <laughs> but that's that's pretty much the stuff I can talk about. But we have more coming down the pipeline for sure. <laughs> to uh, now for people that are listening and maybe they want to 
they either got questions like something I didn't ask you, or they want to check out when these new products release. What's the best way to follow you guys and be able to see when you know, this stuff's out or be able to reach out and say, Hey, that well, Patrick yeah. guy didn't ask the right question on the podcast. <laughs> and, I, and I want to know this. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. Just uh, as always, you know, you can get a hold of us at sales at stainless uh, You know, sometimes the phones are on fire and uh, we can't catch them all sometimes, but definitely don't forget. We have a, we got an email that we got like five of us answered. And um, we can definitely get you back to you, back to you there. Um, of course, we got the, the the social medias and whatnot. You know, the check out the TikToks and the the YouTubes and the the Facebook, Instagram, all the basics. You know, um, and uh, definitely get a hold of us and you know, holler at us, and we can get you get you all your questions answered for sure. Well, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to uh, not just seeing the products, but the racing. So I'm going to be bugging you here in a couple of weeks to oh, see yeah. if you got heck a cell yeah. phone signal and some yeah. time. I love that oh, walk heck around. Yeah, yeah man. Did. Heck yeah, yeah. I can't cool. wait to be. I've never raced at that track. Um, I've seen it on TV, uh, you know, a hundred times. Uh, I've been to Bradenton, Florida, just nor- just close to Orlando Speedway, but never been to that track. Always wanted to go down there racing. So when they announced that, uh, you know, uh, we were going to be going there, I got pretty excited. So some of the fastest cars in the world race at that track. And, uh, right now we got the fastest diesel door car on the planet. And, uh, we got some, we got some plans when we show up at that track this, this, uh, next couple of weeks coming up. Well, it's always really cool to chat with you, Johnny. I appreciate you answering those questions mm-hmm. and now I can uh, direct listeners towards this episode. If they want to know how to install my turbo right, how not to install it or you know, make mm-hmm. decisions based on you know, which one should I get. So appreciate yeah, you yeah. chatting with me today, giving me kind of an inside peek at what's coming up and then yeah, ra- race season starting. So I look forward to that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a crazy year. Can't wait. Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 2024-DIESEL40 for 40% off MSRP. If you need a new knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site, around the house, they've definitely got you covered with a bunch of different knives to meet any budget, different choices for opening mechanism, blade steel, blade shape, handle material. They've definitely got you covered. Also, Target Sports USA has a bunch of cool giveaways that they're doing. If you join their membership program, it's ninety. a year and with that you get free shipping whether it's one box or 20 boxes 50 75 boxes they've got you covered plus an instant eight percent discount you also get notified of new product in stock right away so if you're looking for something that's difficult to find maybe locally they notify you they have two giveaways that they give away to their members every year the first is an all-expense-paid hunting trip to colorado that includes airfare accommodations uh, lodging, also the, the fee for the hunt, the licensing, everything you need, plus f- complimentary meat processing and shipping back to you. And then also they give away an F-150 every year, which is really cool. So you're automatically entered in to win both of those, and there's nothing else you have to do after it. If you go to targetsportsusa.com forward slash diesel PC, you'll find all the details right there. Also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen of 23 Diesel, Cutter Up Rob, J. Cole, also Kobe, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube podcast apps, follow us on social media. We appreciate all your support here in your eight of the diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you guys more of the content you want to hear in 2024. Till next time, keep the shiny side up.